we're just uh, we're gonna get started. Um, so I want to start by thanking everybody for for coming out today. Uh, this will be a little bit different than most of our uh, uh, broadcasting. You can expect to be here for about an hour. Um, but today we'll be talking about international criminal law and specifically universal jurisdiction. So uh, this ties in very well with IHL, as you'll come to see shortly. Um, so a little bit about myself. My name is Hunter Burke. I'm a second year law student at the University of Texas School of Law in Austin, Texas. Um, and I'm, I've been a part of the Red Cross since last May, so I'm coming up on my year soon. And last summer, I was a, an IHL intern for this team, and I am very fortunate to still be able to uh, work alongside such a great team. So please use uh, the chat. Um, we have a Q&A function that you're able to uh, send questions our way, and uh, we'll have some time at the end to address those. And of course, those reactions, as uh, Thomas uh, noted. All right, so let's get started. So today's event is based on a paper that I wrote for a class last semester. Uh, I am throwing into the chat the link to that. So if you're interested in learning about uh, this topic in more depth, far more information that I could uh, talk about in this over the course of an hour. Um, so it's worth noting that this paper reflects my views and not necessarily those of the American Red Cross or the Red Cross movement. Um, but it is a, a working paper that I'm hoping to get published sometime in the future. So please go enjoy it. And uh, hopefully I can explain uh, in brief what uh, I cover. So what is international criminal law? So when somebody asks you, why does international law matter? Um, how, how does it get enforced? Like all these tragic things are happening, but it seems like it never actually uh, has any force. Here's why. Um, so obviously this could, this, there's, there's full law school courses that teach this. It could be taught over several semesters and of course a full career. So how can I teach this in the next couple of minutes that you get a, a brief understanding of what this is all about? So international criminal law contemplates international criminal responsibility. That is, you can commit a crime and be punished for it for doing things that are particularly heinous that international law wants to intervene and stop people from doing. Um, so international law isn't just putting blame on states as is common in some uh, uh, international law regimes, but individual soldiers, commanders, and even uh, pol politicians can face responsibility for crimes related to this. Um, and so if you have a, a criminal law system, you have to have several enforcement mechanisms. So international law is unique that it has several different options. So you have, you have the international tribunals, you have hybrid or ad hoc tribunals, and then you have national jurisdictions. So let's get into those a little more specifically. Uh, so individual criminal responsibility. So, uh, the ICRC had a study in 2005 uh, that tries to unravel customary international law um, in IHL. And so rule 151 of that says that individuals are criminally responsible for war crimes they commit. And this makes a lot of sense. If you think about uh, the event we had a few weeks back on uh, the UCMJ that Thomas did, soldiers are held liable for the crimes that they uh, commit. So if you go and uh, shoot a civilian, the uh, military will hold you accountable for that crime uh, as they're obligated to do under the Geneva Conventions. So IHL considers individual criminal responsibility through the grave breaches in uh, the Geneva Conventions for international armed conflicts and for serious violations of Common Article 3 for NIACs. Um, so some examples of this can be willful killing, uh, torture, inhumane treatment, and the exhaustive destruction of property. International criminal responsibility also contemplates command responsibility. So uh, for war crimes committed under their orders, a commander can be held responsible, or if they know about or should know about 
a violation and they fail to act, that is also considered a criminal offense under IHL. And there's also this element that uh, some people think that if a soldier receives an order, they have to follow it. That's not true. Uh, you can, as a soldier, you can be held uh, for war crimes uh, if such an order is manifestly unlawful. So if you know somebody as a civilian and you are ordered to target them and you execute that strike, you and your commander are both criminally liable for that action. So let's move to some of those enforcement mechanisms that I talked about. So the next several slides are gonna talk about criminal courts that are available for enforcing IHL. So the ICC was established by the Rome Statute and it came into effect in 2002 and there are currently 123 states party. It's based in The Hague, which is in the Netherlands and they have a clear definition of crimes uh, under the treaty that they have jurisdiction over. And there have been uh, a few high profile cases that this court has overseen. It does have several valid criticisms that it's slow and expensive and fails to uh, uh, actually go forward with lots of prosecutions, but it, that is part of the system and it is meant to be a complementary system where it doesn't have the primary uh, role in this enforcement, but it is there for particularly high ranking officials. So next you have the ad hoc tribunals. So we have a few uh, important recent uh, types of these tribunals. You have the International Criminal Tribunal for the for former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, um, which you can see a nice picture of there on the left. And then you have the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. Um, these were both set up in the 90s um, and they were, they're created by the UN Security Council. Um, and it's a great example of enforceability for both international humanitarian law and uh, international human rights law. And so both of uh, these were combined into the international residual mechanisms for the criminal tribunals um, a few years ago. And that is what handles um, any leftover cases. But as you can see by these figures, Lots of uh, people were held to account for their crimes um, and it, it served an important purpose for moving uh, both of those regions forward after the fact. So then we have uh, the UN backed courts. So these take several different flavors. Um, usually there is a, a state that goes through a, a civil war, or a terrible, uh, authoritarian regime. And uh, after the fact, after that person's deposed, uh, there is a call for justice and the international community essentially backs that country by uh, putting up these courts and funding a lot of the prosecutions. So one of these examples is the special court for Sierra Leone, um, which was established in the early 2000s after uh, their civil war from, I think, 1997 to 2002, if I'm not mistaken. So the picture of the right here is a man named Charles Taylor. He was the president of Liberia. Um, so this court uh, was established under uh, the UN. And so Charles Taylor uh, was accused of war crimes under Common Article 3 and AP2, as this was a non-international armed conflict and uh, for crimes against humanity. Um, and he is most infamous for his conscription of child soldiers. Ultimately, he was tried in the Netherlands and sentenced to 50 years. And he is currently serving that prison sentence in the United Kingdom. Um, there's several other examples of uh, these types of tribunals uh, in Lebanon and Cambodia and Senegal. So, that brings us to national courts. Uh, there are five jurisdictional bases generally accepted in international law. So why is this an important uh, consideration for trying to establish jurisdiction over somebody? So essentially, the jurisdiction is the court's ability to command a person to do something. And so when it comes to international criminal law, the main concern is state sovereignty. So there are five generally accepted um, jurisdictional bases 
uh, here. So the first is territorial, and that is what we're most used to. Um, so this is when you have the right to prosecute a crime committed on your own territory. So if there is a uh, a person uh, who commits a crime in America, the U.S. can prosecute them for crimes. There are some certain examples under uh, diplomatic law, but we're not going to get into those. Um, second up is nationality. So you have the right to prosecute your own citizens regardless of the location of the crime. So this is important. So say I am an American citizen and I go to France and commit a crime and I come back to the U.S., the U.S. can prosecute me in the U.S., or they can extradite me to France for that um, crime. But it, it essentially is a, a, a tool against impunity. Next is passive personality. Um, and so this is the right to prosecute foreign crimes that affect your citizens. Um, so uh, a, a recent example of this would be the uh, the trial in the Netherlands of the MH17 uh, strike that took down the KLM flight that was going over Ukraine back in 2014. Recently, a few people had been tried for the, the act of shooting down that plane. And even though the crime took place in uh, Ukraine, the Netherlands had jurisdiction over these people because uh, the uh, over 200 Dutch people had been killed in uh, that attack. Like, or likely a, an American citizen had been on that plane. If, a, if one of those fighters who shot down that plane had been in the US, the US could have tried them under this passive personality. Next is the protective principle, which is the right to prosecute foreign crimes that affect your state security. Um, and it, it's very similar to the previous one, but it has a, a little more uh, interest to it. So essentially, if there's a, a spy in Canada who's spying against the U.S., the U.S. could prosecute him uh, for, for such a thing. And then that brings us to universality, which is what our main topic will be here today. So universality is the right to prosecute foreign crimes because they are so serious that the duty to prosecute them transcends all borders. And so let me explain what that means throughout the rest of this presentation. So universal jurisdiction, what is that, Yeah, right? Um, I'm sure that's what we're all here to learn about. Um, so it is essentially the criminal prosecution of an individual by a country where the crime did not take place and neither the suspect nor any of the victims were from that country. So on this slide, I put no location, no suspect, no victims, no problem. So the crimes that are usually considered um, for this are war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and torture. So let me put this in a, a similar example. Um, so let me just make a hypothetical. Uh, say I am a uh, U.S. citizen, and I go and commit terrible acts in Canada, France can prosecute me because of how bad the crime was, even though I'm not a French citizen, no French citizens were hurt, and the crime committed in Canada. Hopefully that makes it uh, pretty clear. Um, so let's look at a real example. So uh, here is a, a real case from uh, January 2022. Uh, so Lynn was a Syrian defector in 2012. So he got to Germany in 2014 as part of the uh, massive migration uh, into Europe. Um, but it turns out that he had been the head of the uh, General Intelligence Directorate, which is the internal state security um, for Syrian government in Damascus. Um, so this group was really active in trying to quell dissent during the Arab Spring riots. So Germany eventually found out who this guy was and they arrested him. Um, and in January 2022, like I said, he was tried, convicted, and sentenced to life imprisonment for crimes against humanity related to that Syrian civil war that he'd been part of. So 
again, Germany was relying on universal jurisdiction for this. The crimes were happened in Syria. The victims were Syrian, although many may now be refugees in Germany, that would be an insufficient jurisdictional basis otherwise. And then lastly, Raz Raslin was Syri Syrian, and then although he was trying to abuse their migrant system, uh, it's still universal jurisdiction provided the basis for his criminal prosecution. All right, so let's talk about the history of universal jurisdiction. So universal jurisdiction has a long history beginning on the high seas with uh, our favorite Captain Jack Sparrow here and other pirates. Um, so a little history on pirates. They originally started out um, working for uh, the states. So every one of these major colonial powers this time had um, privateers, um, which were essentially just pirates working for the state. Um, so essentially you could go and pillage other boats as long as they weren't from your own. Um, ultimately, countries found this to be uh, problematic and they revoked that privilege to go pillage other ships. Um, but the people who were doing this thought it made good money. They thought they were good at it. And so they kept uh, going about doing these uh, acts uh, that were clearly unlawful. The, the world saw that they had a major problem with this. So they uh, created this idea of universality as pirates were the enemy of all mankind. If you found a pirate on the seas, it didn't matter if they were in your waters or had ever went against your country, you could bring them back and prosecute them. Uh, so that's, that's a really fun anecdote about the, the start of this practice. But this evolved into the uh, al dedere al judicare uh, provisions in uh, a lot of important IHL and IHRL treaties later. So this is a Latin phrase that uh, literally means to surrender or to judge, um, which is understood to mean to extradite or prosecute. So let's talk about what those look like. So on the left here, you have an example of an extradition. So I have a picture of El Chapo there. And so he was extradited to the US by Mexico um, for, for crimes committed. And so on the right here, you have a picture of, uh, of a prosecution where a country decided to uh, not extradite, but to rather to uh, to prosecute somebody. So this is Hussein Abre. He was the president of Chad um, for, for a long time. And ultimately he was uh, overthrown and forced to flee uh, to Senegal. And so at that time, Belgium had a very strong universal jurisdiction law and they requested um, extradition of uh, Habre to uh, to Belgium. The Senegal refused, um, but the ICJ, the International uh, Court of Justice, ordered them to either extradite to Belgium or to prosecute as consistent with their obligations under the Convention Against Torture. Uh, Senegal said that they were not gonna extradite to a non-African country, and so they were forced to prosecute. Um, they, they dragged their feet for a while, um, and with the support uh, financially from uh, UN countries, uh, they established the extra, uh, Extraordinary African Chambers, which had the sole purpose of prosecuting this man. Um, he was prosecuted, sentenced, and died a few years later. So let's talk, so I introduced the what what these provisions were, but how did they actually look in these treaties? So here on the screen, I have a, uh, a picture of the 1949 Geneva Conventions. Um, so this is a common article across all four conventions. So in uh, the first convention, it's Article 49, the second convention, Article 50, the third, Article 129, and the fourth, Article 146. Um, so this first bullet point, you can see the 
the obligation to prosecute. So you, it is a, a mandatory, that is you shall be under the obligation to search for persons alleged to commit these acts. And uh, you must bring such persons, you must try them before your own courts. Uh, so if you notice there, there's the regardless of their nationality, that is a very important thing here because if you think about it, in a, in, a, in a conflict, in an international conflict for which this applies, obviously either country could prosecute uh, people who are committing uh, grave breaches, which I discussed earlier, because either they have an obligation as them being a soldier of their armed forces, or they have an obligation because the other armed forces had somebody committing violations. It, since it says regardless of their nationality, this makes it apply to other countries. So the the article here doesn't just say that parties to the conflict have to search for and prosecute such people, but regardless of their nationality. So it applies to uh, neutral parties here. Uh, and then the second piece, um, it, it allows for such uh, countries to uh, extradite uh, as long as it's according to their own laws and that that other country has made it a prima facie case, um, which is just some fancy Latin words for uh, and it, it could sustain uh, a, a verdict um, without, without opposition. So essentially uh, similar to getting a uh, that's the word I'm looking for, uh, a grand jury indictment, similar to that. Okay, so let's look at some other uh, international humanitarian, humanitarian law and human rights treaties. So the first one we have here is the second protocol to the Hague Convention on Cultural Property. So anybody who's been associated with YAC, our youth action campaign over the last few years, will notice this symbol. So this is the blue shield, and so it's an emblem that identifies and protects cultural property in the event of armed conflict. Uh, so the Hague Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property of 1954 was intended to safeguard cultural property. And the second protocol uh, really built out the criminal responsibility and jurisdictional procedures in the event of a violation. So this extends to both international armed conflicts and to non-international armed conflicts. So if we look here at the text of the treaty, it says, take such measures as may be necessary to establish its jurisdiction in cases alleged uh, where the alleged offender is present in any, ter any territory under its jurisdiction and it does not extradite him. So that is a clear, you must prosecute or extradite regardless of where the offense take place so long as they're on your territory. So essentially, you have no other connection to the individual except for uh, they happen to be on your territory and they were a victim and you choose not to extradite them. We have other examples of this. So like I mentioned earlier, the Convention Against Torture. So this is a very widely ratified convention. There are 173 parties. So this is actually one of the most widely ratified conventions out there. Many, many countries did add reservations, which complicate this, but again, we're not going to, we don't need to get too deep into that. Um, but again, let's look at the text here. So establish its jurisdiction over such offenses in cases where the alleged offender is present in any territory under its jurisdiction and it does not extradite him. This is very similar to the last one. And again, you're going to see this in other examples that this is a contemplated way to prescribe uh, jurisdiction on these people or on, on these member uh, states uh, to sort of force their hand to uh, actually prosecute people accused of these things. Uh, so like I said, we have other examples. So we have the Enforced Disappearances Convention. Um, and I'm just going to highlight, it's the same exact formula, if you will. So essentially establish jurisdiction to 
uh, enforce this treaty um, for anybody present on your territory, or you can extradite them. So it's it's really trying to prevent allowing states to provide a safe haven um, for uh, human rights violators. And our and my, and the last example here is just just to re reiterate that point is uh, the UN uh, personnel convention. Uh, it, it's the exact same formula. Establish jurisdiction when there's somebody on your territory, and they don't extradite that person. So, regardless of where the crime is, make jurisdiction and either prosecute or extradite him. So, what? How do states understand this obligation under international law? So, I am just going to reference uh, the U.S. Navy handbook because um, it, it's pretty straightforward, and there's plenty of other examples of this. If you're if you're curious, I cite a lot of other examples in my paper, um, uh, particularly in the footnotes. And there's tons of other literature out there that talk through um, how states have understood this. So the U.S. Navy in this handbook says uh, that international law generally recognizes five bases, uh, including universal jurisdiction. Uh, they also note that certain offenses are so heinous and so widely condemned that any nation uh, can apprehend, prosecute, and punish that offender on behalf of the world community. Um, uh, war crimes committed by enemy nationals can be tried as offenses against international law, and this forms uh, part of the law of the United States, uh, as admitted in uh, these. So let's just go outside of the US for a minute. Where have these prosecutions taken place? So Amnesty International has done several studies um, on this. And in 2012, they released a report that did a really good job of documenting, one, where the legislation for universal crimes existed. And they found that about three quarters um, of, of the world um, had at least one international crime that was recognized in their national legislation. While this is far short of what many countries are obligated to do based on their treaty obligations, it is still significant that uh, there is a, a wide understanding of what this means. So that brings us to where have prosecutions actually taken place? So we have seen prosecutions in Argentina, Austria, Australia, Belgium, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Israel, the Netherlands, Norway, Paraguay, Senegal, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, the UK, and the US. Um, there's been other countries that haven't prosecuted anybody, but they've opened investigations. So in South Africa, they have a, they had a Supreme Court decision that told the national police and a prosecutor that they were forced to uh, investigate complaints against officials from Zimbabwe um, that were suspected of torture. Uh, and there was also, uh, they similarly opened an investigation of allegations that the uh, president of Madagascar uh, was responsible for crimes against humanity. So I say all this to say that there is a, a good broad understanding by states that these treaties uh, were created in such a way to uh, allow for universal jurisdiction and just the willingness for uh, for prosecutions uh, considering this. So that brings up an important point that we should discuss. Does this qualify as customary international law? So what is customary international law? Uh, it's uh, a norms-based system that becomes equally binding as a treaty. And uh, so, so how does it form? So under the ICJ statute, um, the court whose function is to decide in accordance with international law, such disputes as are submitted to it shall apply international custom as evidence of general practice accepted as law. 
So how can we understand this? So I have this ni uh, nice little chart here to sort of walk us through it. So we have this first prong, general practice. That can also be mean uh, as state practice. So what are states actually doing? Um, so this generally requires at least three things. So you need a consistency or uniform approach. So that is um, countries are acting similarly. So it's not just one country doing it. It's, it's a broad scope of countries who have a similar understanding about something. You have a duration piece. Um, and so some argue, and I'm sympathetic to the view, that there is a, a shorter timeline for um, IHL and IHRL here uh, for forming customary international law. And that's due in part to the common interest in compliance, or in my paper, I refer to this as the uh, common suffering and non-compliance. So that is, we want people to be held to a high standard when it comes to these sorts of laws as not following them leads to wide scale uh, abuses and uh, civilian uh, hurt. And so that brings us to generality. So that means that you need to be applicable to allow all scenarios with similar facts. So you don't want a super specific fact set because that misses the point of uh, applying the law evenly and fairly. So that's the first prong. So what are states actually doing? That brings us to the second prong, which is opinio juris um, and the accepted as law. So you have to be doing this thing for under the, the pretenses that you believe you're doing so in a legal sense. So that makes the first question being, what are states doing? And then why are they doing this thing? So it's not enough for a state to do something they need to think that they're doing this thing in order to comply with pre-existing law. So it makes a, a really uh, an important limitation on that general practice. So you need to be not only doing this thing, but you need to believe you're doing so under an international legal obligation. And there, there are some important uh, customary international law things to consider such as the persistent objector rule. But again, we don't need to go there. Happy to talk about that if you feel so inclined. Um, so in my view, and, and I argue in this piece, that there is a minimum common understanding of UJ under customary international law. So there are clearly established universal jurisdiction provisions in these treaties. But outside of those treaties, it's a little more confined. However, I recognize that there is some uh, uh, widespread understanding. And so I'll talk about later, it's sort of, I view it as a spectrum. So there are some people in some countries that have a, a more limited view, and then there's some that have a, a much broader view. And hence, that is why I named this piece the need to clarify universal jurisdiction. So I, I will talk about later some of the challenges that uh, I think the practice has and how that leads to uh, some issues. But let's see what other people have to say. So the ICRC tuned in on this. So in that same 2005 study I talked about earlier, they listed in rule 157 that states have the right to vest universal jurisdiction in their national courts over war crimes. So in comparison to the Geneva Conventions, which are a mandatory um, obligation for states to uh, either extradite or prosecute, this is a permissive, they have the right uh, to use universal jurisdiction with regards to war crimes. So this rule is not without contest. Um, so the US uh, had a very strong position when this study came out uh, to, to many parts of it, but particularly this, this section. Um, so it's important to remember that this was during Iraq and Afghanistan. And, um, and so there was obviously some uh, some gamesmanship going on there from 
US political decision makers, but that position is not completely without merit. And there is a, a really good article on this piece that I cite in my paper um, by a, a professor, Eric Leonard. And I highly recommend if you're interested in sort of that US ICR, ICRC split, I would consult that. Um, Siri thought she should chime in there. Um, so that brings us to what has the ICJ said? So if you see her on the left, that is the Peace Palace, which is in The Hague, and that is the seat of uh, the ICJ. And so they had this come before them in the arrest warrants case. Uh, so the arrest warrant uh, was issued a few days after I was born in 2000. And uh, uh, so Belgium issued a, an arrest warrant uh, to the uh, to to various countries around the world, uh, alleging the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, as a uh, perpetrating crimes against humanity, uh, and so the DRC did not like this, and so they uh, filed. Uh, to have the ICJ step in and say, Belgium, you can't do this. And so they originally presented two positions that would uh, stop uh, Belgium from doing this. Their first uh, was the sovereign immunity piece. So they said that as a sitting minister of foreign affairs, Belgium could not have, or that he would have immunity in Belgian courts as a, a, a sitting head of state or official capacity. The second piece was universal jurisdiction. Ultimately, uh, the, uh, the DRC removed the universal jurisdiction piece. So the majority opinion and the, the holding of the court, the judgment did not talk about universal jurisdiction. However, as you see in the picture on the right, there is a lot of separate and dissenting opinions. And these do talk about universal jurisdiction and they have a lot of different opinions on what that looks like in international law in the year 2002. So what I argue in my paper is that all the judges for the most part appear on some limited form. Um, you see in the, uh, the ad hoc uh, Van den Van Geert's uh, she she was the placed on the court by Belgium, and obviously gave a very Belgium symp sympathetic thing. But she talks about um, in a very pro universal jurisdiction uh, argument. And then you have some of the other ones that are essentially saying you can only use universal jurisdiction when the person is on your territory, so you don't have the right to go and. Uh, request extradition from other countries uh, just because you think somebody is a war criminal. So that sets up this uh, important divide. And so we still have yet to get a definitive answer from the ICJ, but it is interesting that they have this previous dialogue. And I will mention that in the uh, Hissé and Aubrey case that I talked about earlier that went before the ICJ, they allude to universal jurisdiction quite a bit. And sort of the important distinction is whether universal jurisdiction is understood as customary international law or as a treaty-based provision. And so there's this, this, this uh, push and pull that the international community really needs to, to deal with. So that brings me to uh, some modern examples. Where are we seeing universal jurisdiction popping up? So in, in the 2011, you had the, uh, the Arab Spring revolutions start across uh, much of the Arab world from Tunisia to Syria to, to Yemen. And so I put a picture here of a, uh, a Syrian refugee arriving in Munich with a picture of Angela Merkel. So Germany took on 
uh, I think it was somewhere around 680,000 uh, Syrian refugees. And uh, in my view, a lot of uh, these were people just trying to flee a conflict zone, people who are innocent civilians trying to escape with their lives. Unfortunately, that allows bad actors such as Anwar Raslin that I talked about earlier to slip through the cracks. And that's why I, I think universal jurisdiction is such an important thing to be talking about right now, because you have these massive migration movements and then you have uh, countries who are trying to accept them, but they don't want their systems to be abused. So you have this important uh, international criminal law responsibility to provide justice and also you know, support your other political aspirations. So what are their options with somebody like Anwar Roslin? So under international law, you can't deport him back to Syria because he likely faces torture as he was a government official who fled. Um, so either torture or death, which is in violation of international law, but you can't just let him sit in with the civilian population. So universal jurisdiction provides an important uh, resource for these countries. Uh, and so you've seen uh, Germany do this. Uh, you've seen uh, Sweden have prosecutions, France as well. Uh, so this is something that's slowly making its, its way uh, through. The second one here is the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So in response to that, we have seen the formation of the Joint Investigation Team, or the JIT. Um, and several countries um, have partnered with that using universal jurisdiction as that, uh, to make that they're uh, able. So this allows them to provide investigative support, monetary support, and the sort of the guidance and how to preserve evidence for eventual war crimes, uh, prosecutions. So again, this is a very important uh, thing for these states to be able to use as uh, supporters through uh, their own domestic policies as well. Like I said, like everything, there are challenges. So let's talk about uh, the four main challenges that I found um, in my research. And so I think one thing to point out before I get into it is that just extraterritorial trials outside of universal jurisdiction and with universal jurisdiction aren't going to be perfect. There's going to be hurdles and, and obstacles, and it's important to try to uh, come up with ways that make those obstacles limited. So the first one we're going to talk about here is geopolitical issues. So in 2009, the European Union and the African Union entered into dialogue. So this was after both the arrest warrant case and the Habre case. And so the this dialogue, uh, each group submitted some uh, academic experts. They both engaged uh, in discussions amongst their, their leaders and representatives. And they came to the conclusion, or, or they, they came for some, some preliminary conclusions that made it, uh, they called uh, to improve national legislation. So there is less of a need for um, extraterritorial prosecutions, which is ultimately a good thing. Um, but they do mention that they want to prioritize friendly international relations over justice, which is a, a uh, difficult uh, issue. Um, so on one hand, you have them calling for stronger uh, legislation, but you also see that sort of pushback. So uh, going on today is a UN committee that is looking at the future of universal jurisdiction. And so the countries that are part of this, they ultimately disagree on what universality looks like. So like I said earlier, I want to show this as a spectrum. So on one end, 
you have Germany, who is super willing to investigate and prosecute um, under universal jurisdiction, so long as criteria under German law are met. On the other end of that, you have India, who claim that piracy is the only undisputed crime for universal jurisdiction. So you have this spectrum, and we need to continue this international dialogue to, to clarify what this looks like. So why are geopolitical, uh, why, why is this an issue? So many uh, commentators, uh, particularly on the, the African continent, view at least the implementation of universal jurisdiction as a form of modern colonialism. Um, they view it as the global north coming in to tell the global south how to run their countries. Um, and this, this argument has a lot of merit um, as all, there has never been a universal jurisdiction trial by a global South country against a global North. Maybe we'll see that change in the future, but it is something to be conscious of as we uh, try to uh, further develop this area of the law. That brings us next to national politics. So globally, we've seen a a, a rise in national populism and an anti-globalism. So this has two important uh, elements. So that is going to limit your global cooperation. That is countries are taking a, a more focused step uh, stance on their on themselves. Um, and this is important for universal jurisdiction as these trials often cost a lot. Um, and there's also the second element that uh, there's a lack or a limited uh, protection of minority groups. Essentially, that's not our purview to go and take care of these other people. And this also sets up an important electoral calculus for people who wouldn't consider themselves to be an anti-globalist, but they don't want to be called a globalist when they're running for election. So there's, there's some national pol uh, political uh, implications for this sort of uh, jurisdiction. That brings us to legal issues. So some legal issues that I note in this paper are a lack of adequate legislation. So like I said, three quarters of countries in the world have universal jurisdiction for at least one international law, but very few have it for every recognized international crime. That presents issues uh, for pur pursuing prosecutions. There's also the question of immunities. So these can take very different forms. You have head of state immunity. You have um, an immunity that I'll talk about next with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then you have uh, some obstacles to extradition. Um, so sometimes a state is not willing to extradite its citizens, for instance, um, and that presents uh, some difficulties. So let's talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, so this was uh, in the post-apartheid uh, Republic of South Africa, and it essentially granted criminal and uh, civil immunity to people who participated in the apartheid. And they ultimately prioritized creating a factual record because they viewed this as an important tool for uh, both peacemaking and building on that peace after uh, the state was reborn, if you will. So in granting this sort of immunity, there becomes the question of whether other countries have to similarly follow that immunity, or if, say, one of these people who admits to crimes that they committed on the apartheid under this uh, immunity blanket if they went and traveled to another country who has universal jurisdiction laws, would that country be able to prosecute for them for crimes or would this immunity be sufficient um, in, in, in those courts? And so that sets up some interesting issues with uh, allowing these commissions as they're important for building that peace, but also not allowing these commissions to be established just for the sake of getting people off the hook criminally and just providing a, a sham. Uh, 
So that brings us uh, to our last um, issue. And obviously there could be plenty more, but these were the main, main ones that I thought needed to be addressed uh, and better understood to, uh, to come up with solutions to uh, the issues around universal jurisdiction right now. So I, I, I do a short uh, overview in the paper of fair trial guarantees the uh the difficulties in language barriers uh the problems of evidence in an extraterritorial prosecution and the issue of in absentia trials so let me get into these a little more so first trials must be fair that makes a lot of different things in international law there's the international covenant covenant on civil and political rights which has some uh important guidelines for how to uh, come up with uh, uh, minimum guarantees for a trial. Uh, so I, I, I view venue, like where the actual trial takes place, whether that's in a military court or in a, in a civilian court, the judicial application of IHL. Um, so this is a, a main concern when trials take place outside of the military court, because usually those uh, the judge, the the prosecutor, the defense attorney, the jurors, they have uh, training in IHL, which has uh, a lot of unique defenses that don't hold up in other trials. Um, and there, there's other guarantees as well. So I, I make the case that having a, a, a fair trial is also helping victims because it means that there's less chance of overturn on appeal and some other uh, just justice inducing things. So next I'll talk about language. So there's often difficulties. Imagine you're having a trial in a German court for a Syrian person. Um, do they have to provide language translation to that person, to the press, to the entire courtroom as there's a lot of victims there. And so the we can use the Anwar Raslin example as sort of uh, a test case. So originally they were very reluctant to provide language uh, translations and it's expensive um, and, and slows down the, the justice process. Uh, they took this to the German constitutional court, which, um, uh, uh, essentially said that there had to be a uh, translation provided for the defense, uh, that is the defendant, and for um, one reputable journalist. So essentially the a lot of uh, Syrian refugees could be in the courtroom, but they couldn't understand what's happening. So this is a limiting form of justice um, for victims who aren't able to follow the trial live. Um, so it was sort of a, a, a small victory, but it, it wasn't fully sufficient in my view. Um, and then there, uh, there's the evidence piece. So extraterritorial trials, both universal jurisdiction and others, are difficult for both the prosecution and the defense. Um, so non-governmental organizations, so I'm thinking of like Human Rights Watch and others like that, they have an outsized role in these. Um, this has to do with the fact that uh, they usually only need a visa in to go into the, the country, as opposed to the, the state, if they wanted to go into another country to find evidence for prosecution, they would have to get the state's permission. So if you're trying to try a former government official for crimes committed by a government, there's gonna be some difficulty there. So having NGOs is good for collecting evidence, but it also creates some chain of commit, uh, 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 some, some evidence chain issues, uh, concerns, um, and it's an important thing that we, we recognize that. There's also the security of evidence. If you're having a, in, in this Germany example, having evidence go from Syria to Germany, that's a long distance. You wanna make sure it's secure. And then you also have the, the security of witnesses. So if you're having witnesses that are traveling internationally, 
that puts them at risk. So you have to make sure that you're providing adequate security for those people. Um, so that brings us to my last point, which is in absentia. Uh, there's a lot of general criticism about in absentia, um, and I'm not going to get too deep into those. But essentially, in absentia means trials without the accused. So that is, I commit a crime. This place doesn't have me in their custody, but they want to try me anyways. Again, like I said, it's problematic. Um, and so some of, depending on the, the type of jurisdiction, some of these include um, investigation as part of in absentia. I don't think that's necessarily fair, but it is a concern that needs to be considered. And uh, just going back to the ICCPR, uh, they say that trials need to have the defendant's presence, but the uh, Human Rights Committee uh, has said that this can be uh, deemed to be waived for failure to show in court. So it, they really walk that back a bit. But like I said, there's plenty of issues uh, to, to be reluctant on that. All right, so that brings us to the end of my presentation. I think we have a few minutes for Q&A. I hope we're able to get to some. Um, my, I put my email up on here, so please, um, feel free to email me specifically with any comments or feedback on this presentation, or if you get a chance to look at uh, the paper I wrote, please feel free to uh, to uh, to send me an email, and I'm happy to hear um, any questions that we have. Yeah, outstanding job, Hunter. This is Thomas Harper, the senior legal advisor for the IHL team. I just want to give everyone a moment to to use those emojis to congratulate Hunter. He put a lot of work, not just into that paper, but into this presentation. Uh, this is a great example of the sort of opportunity uh, that uh, that you can seize as a volunteer. And, and I'm particularly proud of Hunter because this started as a topic that he didn't know anything about and, and was interested in researching more. <clears throat> and, and here we are just a few months later, and, and he's uh, fleshed out an entire paper and done a national presentation on it. So hats off to you, Hunter, for the hard work. We do have a few questions. Uh, the first was, uh, does, you mentioned that uh, at the time, I don't know if it, you intentionally mentioned it as being past tense, but uh, it sounded like it was uh, Belgium's strong universal jurisdiction law was maybe past tense. Does that, do they still observe or have that same um, take on your universal jurisdiction? So it was purposely past tense. So Belgium enacted this law in 1993. And so for the next 10 years, they did a lot of high profile investigations. Uh, they had um, complaints against uh, uh, Prime Minister Sharon in Israel uh, and some other really important people. And that, that's put a lot of international relations sort of going back to that geopolitical um, issue. Uh, so in 2003, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was, uh, I believe, the defense secretary at that time, uh, basically told Belgium that if they didn't change their law, that we were going to take NATO out of Brussels. Uh, and that quickly changed the tune of Belgium. And they uh, changed that law that now they have to have the defendant be on their territory to go. So it's sort of that more limited version of UJ. Great, great answer. Thank you for that. So next question, we only have time for a couple more, but is there an inherent tension between universal jurisdiction and non-refoulement? I, I think they're actually in more parallel than one might initially uh, presume. Uh, so non-refoulement is the, the principle that you can't extradite to a country that's likely to uh, torture uh, an individual or cause that person uh, other issues. Uh, so I think it's actually pretty parallel. Like I, I mentioned with the Syrian example, universal jurisdiction allows Germany to go about uh, finding justice for victims, at least in some sense, while upholding their international obligations not to let this person go to a country that's going to be tortured. Great. That, that's my view on it. I think it's it's more parallel than than otherwise might be apparent. 
Excellent. I apologize for my butchering of the term. Uh, next question, and this may prove to be the last one. Uh, the release of uh, al-Bashir drew complaints, uh, understandably. Is there an enforceable obligation to invoke universal jurisdiction? Yeah, so al-Bashir is a really important case. Uh, so I believe he was this the Sudanese president uh, who committed a lot of uh, crimes against Fanny and war crimes uh, in his country, and then sort of flaunted that by going around to various uh, countries uh, and kind of like, you won't arrest me, you just won't. Uh, so the ICC ha has some important jurisprudence on this from recent years um, that's worth uh, considering for, for you specifically uh, to find some more on that. So I think given the difficulties in understanding head of state immunity, uh, it is sort of the, the, the harder issue to follow in terms of whether there's an obligation to invoke universal jurisdiction. Like I said, um, under the treaties as they are written, yes, you probably have a duty to take al-Bashir into your custody and to either prosecute or extradite him. If he raises such an immunity upon prosecution, that's one thing, but to just do nothing, I think is is sort of foolish. Um, that that's that's how I would answer it. So I, I think head of state immunity would be the the bigger thing there. Um, but also I think just an overall uh, disconnect between the obligations understood in a lot of these treaties to how they're actually implemented on the ground. Fantastic. That's how I wrap up that one. Well, thanks so much. That brings us to the end of the presentation on behalf of the entire American Red Cross IHL team. First of all, thank you, Hunter, for an outstanding presentation. Thanks to each of you for uh, coming to this presentation or for watching it after the fact. <clears throat> if you are interested in an IHL fellowship or internship with the American Red Cross, we do have those. Uh, we have them for, for uh, attorneys, for um, law students, et cetera. They're great opportunities. Reach out to Hunter, reach out to, to our team, and we're happy to uh, educate you on those. But thank you. Thank you to Hunter, and we'll see you soon. Take care, everyone.